when I look at things from architecture point of view, uh, on left hand side, the input looks like a data. If we all agree that it's a data you collect, right? Mm -hmm. On the other side, uh, for the from output output point of view, you want to make some decision or to do something, right? So mm -hmm. in cybersecurity cases, probably you want to uh, respond to a certain incidents or make some decisions. So, so somehow in between is how we do things. So you have all kinds of solutions to work on that one. So AI is a definitely one of the major way to do that. But just think about you have data flow to you and you need to produce some decision. So there are probably different ways to handling that data. I guess that's also the difference Sean you mentioned from engineering driven or like uh, data driven, right? So maybe, uh, so, but during this process, we will also encounter a lot of challenges. Right, so if there's no perfect solution, uh, they, they all have a pros and cons. So if you guys can elaborate a little bit uh, in the middle part, uh, what kind of a process you think uh, maybe industry best practice and also maybe some uh, challenges you experience. So uh, if you want, I can get to go, go first, but then we can let Sean uh, take it right. from there. Sure. All right, cool. So, well, like, although I'm talking, I'm represent. I guess I'm representing AI, the broad machine learning uh, and reinforcement learning in this segment. Uh, I would like to say that applying machine learning within cybersecurity is not a traditional data science problem. This is something I would state coming from the industry, and and there are certain specific challenges when applying machine learning or AI within cybersecurity, which I feel the industry is not really uh, focusing on. Again, there's certain, quite a few. One would be uh, imbalanced data sets. Again, in, in, in our world, the data sets usually are highly, highly imbalanced, in which case the number of true attacks within the data set could be 0 .0, up to 0.001%. So it's very hard to train a model just based on that little data. Also, we work with dynamic environments, in which case your networks, all, your network traffic always keeps on changing. Uh, attackers are always changing their maneuvers. So again, this is it's not a static data set you're working on. Also, again, one of the biggest assumptions we can't make, which traditional data science folks make, uh, do make, is that the statistical distribution is not static for in our case, because hackers are always trying to outmaneuver your uh, your mechanism. So again. So those are some of the challenges. Then there's another problem where what we have been noticing talking with clients is that uh, the overlap between attacks from different in industries are not as high as stated with, within the context of threat intelligence. Although threat intelligence is I mean, it's definitely beneficial, but what we're noticing is the attack patterns uh, focusing on, say, a, like a power plant would be very would be different than that from, say, a bank or, or, or like a small to medium sized business. Um, again, these are the things we have been noticing. So, again, traditional supervised learning models might not always do the trick. And I think there's another problem is the problem of context. For instance, if you look at uh, machine learning models, right, you're learning from data, but then at the data is specific to your different clients. Different clients have different data, different sensors, different attack patterns they care about. Different, you know, they, they, they care about certain risks based on their unique risk appetite and based on their own IT infrastructure. So the, the problem of context like, is not really well addressed within generic solutions as to how, how do you like how do, how do you do the learning for one client and do something very different for others and um, so the, 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 there are certain challenges there which are not well addressed, but the end impact there is um, analysts uh, uh, have to go through a large number of alerts like, within security operations centers, and many of them are false positives, and it takes them a long time to de detect and deflect attacks. Um, and I, again, so so those are some some on a high level some of the challenges, and then what's happening at the end of this analysts are getting stressed because they have the, they're the last line of defense. In which case they have to look at an alert, they have to go to different log sources to actually understand what's happening, and then they, they only have a short amount of time to deflect attacks. And then the analysts, different analysts have different skill sets as well. So cybersecurity is a huge huge field in which case you have your uh, people who are focusing on network traffic, people who are more application security, people who have experience with reverse engineering and whatnot. So again, finding the right people to get the job done is another challenge as well. Um, again, in which case, which is why we are building our solution to, to mitigate some of the challenges in that in that area. Mm. 
Yeah, so Tassin, you actually mentioned uh, quite many uh, areas, so you cover that part. Uh, from data point of view, what I can hear is the quality of data, uh, the representative of the data, the pollution of the data, and also even you get the data, can that data apply to everybody or only apply to very small use cases, right? So something like that. And which also cause, uh, even though you maybe apply some uh, AI algorithm there, but uh, uh, the analysts still have a, a lot of things to do, right? So they're still facing some challenges, a false alarm or all those uh, other areas, right? So to, to get to the decision point, so there's still a long way to go. So that feels like that's also part of your company to try to bridge that gap to, to, uh, to offer some solution in between. Yes, in, uh, within the sim solution and the analysts, we have a different layer which we're working on, which is, falls under human computer interaction. All right, cool. And so, Sean, uh, from your point of view, what do you see the challenges and how, what kind of a relationship among several different approach, how they connect them together? Sure. So, um, if you think about everything that, uh, that Tassim covered, um, it was all data driven. Right, because you're applying different data science approaches uh, to tell you about the patterns in that data and to do things with that data. Um, on the knowledge engineering side, we have different use cases because we're trying to solve different problems with this type of AI than, than the data science side. Um, on our side, we look at challenges like um, integration. So, so when I think about I want to take uh, these different data sets that are coming from different data silos that are in different formats and serializations, and they're talking about different things like threats and vulnerabilities and risks and, and user behavior. I want to be able to take those and, and create a knowledge model of the information coming from those different silos. So if you imagine in, in cybersecurity, we have a bunch of silos, the network silo, the endpoint silo, the application security silo, the identity and uh, authentication silo. Um, it's about being able to create a model using knowledge representation languages like AL to represent the information coming from those silos so we can integrate those and make the, the information coming from the silos semantically interoperable. So it's one of the benefits of these standards coming out of the semantic web area in that it was designed to take information that's, that's heterogeneous, that, that is different from other data sets and be able to convert it into a common language that allows you to integrate those and, and create semantic interoperability so you can start asking questions across those data sets. The other thing that that uh, the other use case beyond semantic interoperability and that kind of integration is where we want to automate how a human actually applies knowledge and reasoning to those different data sets or across those data sets so that way they can solve more complex problems through the integration of the knowledge and the information coming from those different silos. And, and a, a good example of that, if you think about the data science side, it primarily uses probabilistic reasoning, which means that, that the results that are generated are, are tentative hypotheses or, or probabilities. It's probably the thing that you're looking for and it might be a 98% a probability that this is in fact the pattern that you're looking for, but there's always going to be a margin of error. So one of the things that, that we focus in on, a, a use case that we use, is validation. How do I validate that tentative hypothesis? Because it takes the human, because we're pushing it to human analysts now, so it's a matter of capturing that human knowledge and experience and their kind of step-by-step uh, -step workflow of how they do validation, so that way the AI expert systems can validate the prim the preliminary analysis results coming from these different silos. And, and finally, I think the one of the most important use cases for knowledge engineering derived AI is in those cases where you absolutely positively need everything the AI is doing to be explainable and transparent and have reproducible results because there is zero black box uh, approaches within knowledge engineering derived expert systems. It's entirely transparent from the way that you model the knowledge to the way that you apply the knowledge. It's 100% explainable and it's, it's, it's often used, uh, it's, it's heavily used within the medical community 
and and you often hear about some of the first use cases of expert systems where we're uh, competing, capturing all this knowledge from from dozens or, or hundreds of different doctors. So that way the expert system could do things like diagnosis um, better than individual doctors themselves. So those okay. are, are kind of those those uh, the typical use cases. So integrate, automate and validation of, of tentative hypothesis and, and explanation. Wonderful. Um so I noticed the uh, uh, if I'm uh, correct. So I, I noticed a couple of uh, key terms. So we are using kind of uh, things a little bit, maybe the definition of things, right? So one thing I noticed is uh, you uh, the the word you emphasize most is the knowledge, right? So uh, what Tassin talk more is on the data. So kind of like. Uh, if we're using that flow, right? So how do we uh, kind of, uh, if data is the input, how do we convert the data eventually to make some decision? Probably in between is some knowledge there, right? So kind of like a convert, it's like a pipeline or some somehow feels like to see you on the a little bit left hand side uh, and uh, uh, Sean is on the right hand side, kind of like so, a working together to solve a, a problem. In our case, we're in between. So we are in between the analyst and the and the the, the data sources. So again, like again, we we are. I, I feel Sean and I are looking at the same problem, but from a complementary standpoint. And I feel what we're building definitely go hand in hand. Uh, okay. <laughs> yeah, the way that the uh, the AI community normally describes this as the data science side, because it's looking at the data, is taking a bottom up approach. So if you imagine okay. the, the data, information, knowledge, wisdom stack, um, oh, okay. data science starts at the bottom because it's looking at the data and it, it pushes up the raw data, information yeah. about the data, right? And so what I'm doing on the other side is I'm coming from the top down. And so I'm starting with knowledge and I'm integrating mm -hmm. the information coming out of machine learning with the preliminary results so that way I can do things like validate it and look at it within the context of my wider knowledge. And so mm -hmm. the, the AI community refers to knowledge engineering derived AI as the top down approach to reasoning mm -hmm. and the data science side is, is the bottom up approach to reasoning. And, and so you have on the bottom up, you're, you're going from using inductive reasoning, which is, which is uh, specific to a generalized a conclusion about the data and at the knowledge engineering side is using deductive reasoning so it's going from a generalization to a specific so they're very complementary in in their approaches and, and like i said before they're solving different problems because of their different approach so think about it as knowledge driven versus data driven wonderful so uh, to me, it sounds like a uh, human and the machine intelligence collaboration. So kind of like a, from, uh, use a Sean's word, uh, from top-down approach, the knowledge base, uh, basically you draw from uh, the knowledge or the wisdom already in the human like uh, society or industry or specifically in cybersecurity industry. Because you mentioned there are so many frameworks already there. Um, I guess there's a NIST framework, there's a MITRE attack, or those are kind of like a industry framework. People already draw from years of experience. It's there, right? So you don't want to right. waste this. And so, so yeah, go ahead. I think yeah. a, a, you mentioned uh, you mentioned uh, a lot of frameworks that are out there, and I think a great example of that would be uh, something like MITRE's attack. So MITRE's attack is a uh, Adversary tactics, techniques, and common knowledge is what ATT&CK stands for. It's kind of an acronym for the knowledge base. And if you yeah. think about the data science approach, they're really looking in the data for the patterns of the techniques being applied. They mm -hmm. don't really care that that technique applies to a certain tactic or that tactic is happening during a certain phase of the, of the cyber attack life cycle because data science is only focused on the data and detecting that pattern of that technique within the data, whereas the knowledge engineering side, once we validate that that technique has taken place and that it's represented within the data, we want to have the knowledge to help us understand that what the goal of the adversary was, which is execution in the victim's environment and what stage of the cyber attack life cycle that's in because they've made it in before they reached that behavior that was just detected. 
And so it's it's really about having that extra uh, knowledge to understand the context and the situation is is really the strength of the knowledge engineering side that that combines those two together. I see. Okay, wonderful. Kasim, you do you have anything to add on that? No, I think um, like what what Sean mentioned is, is an excellent point. Like one would be first the experimental inference. I've, I've uh, work with quite a few clients and in our case again like the what we get from analysts is that like they, they want to they want to like they only have a short amount of time to deflect the tax in which case the sooner they can make decisions based on inference the better but with traditional certain machine learning models if you, if you don't uh, I mean it doesn't matter to analysts if until analysts they can verify and validate and, and add their own context to uh, the problem that they need to solve in which case explain inference is key. Again, in our case, we, we we look at it from a graph machine learning standpoint. There, there are quite so there are a lot of research work being done in this space to uh, to ensure I mean explainability within within say even deep learning or or even some some reinforcement learning techniques. So we are doing quite a, a bit of research work in, in that space. So that's uh, that's that from an explainability standpoint. And in our case, what like what we do is we look at the alerts, but then we have we model human humans, and then we perform some computation in that regard to optimize certain tasks. So I mean, we don't do attack detection, but then we are optimizing certain uh, certain conditions to make it easier for analysts to quickly resolve tasks. And I think that, and then you have the uh, knowledge engineering side, which Sean has mentioned, which which can further add context to uh, the problem which needs to be solved. Another uh, another good uh, example of. Uh of knowledge engineering that I wanted to mention was uh, the digital forensics and incident response community has been working over the last couple of years to define a common language to represent cyber investigation information. Because all of those, those folks are doing investigations day in and day out in the cyber world. And so they've been collaborating on what's called the cyber investigation analysis standard expression which stand, uh, is abbreviated as CASE for short. And um, it's really an ontology, a formal knowledge representation language. So uh, not only can, can the knowledge representation be used to model a data silo and the data coming out of that, but you can actually use it to capture the, the formal vocabulary of different parts of the industry. So in this case, we're capturing the cyber investigation vocabulary and what data maps to that, those different pieces of vocabulary, like a, uh, a trace of evidence, right? Could be Windows event logs, it could be forensic output of a forensic tool, but it's a way of standardizing, how am I going to call this piece of data in the context of uh, cyber investigations within the digital forensics and incident response community? And, and that's really focused in on supporting semantic interoperability because what they wanted is a common language that allowed all the different tools that are doing pieces of investigation whether it's ai or or a human driven tool to be able to talk the same language and capture the investigation information in a common language and once you uh, establish that common language to support the semantic interoperability piece then you can start adding in the reasoning and the logic to start automating that with with uh with ai to so that the ai can automate part of that investigation and capture its investigation information using that human defined standard language wonderful so i i also hear a lot to break the silos so uh on data science side uh, because you have a uh, data from so many sources you break the silo kind of like uh, you collect the all those data putting them together and uh, try to find some patterns and from knowledge engineering point of view, you also break the silo from each knowledge domain. So, for example, in cybersecurity, you have a forensics, you have a investigation incident, like an attack. Also, so you try to standardize those terminology and putting them together as a common knowledge body, kind of to 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 ensure everybody on the same page. So, I, I think one of the big differences between the two different approaches is that the knowledge engineering side is really trying to organize the data from the different silos around the knowledge models. So mm -hmm. it's organizing it. So if I have uh, 15 different silos that each provide an information about Sean Riley, 
such as the HR system, the identity and access management system, uh, and, and different systems throughout my enterprise. Maybe the badge system has information on me. Uh, the not what the knowledge engineering does is it creates one representation of Sean Riley and then attaches the facts from these different data silos to that Sean Riley. So that way you're doing what's called uh, object based production of knowledge. So you're taking these little facts and assembling them around the objects that they're talking about based on the models, how you model it. And that uh, also encodes the semantic meaning of the data. Mm -hmm. So we're really organizing the the data coming from the silos based on what it means and what it's talking about, where it, which is a, a different type of approach than the way that the data scientists normally do data wrangling and, and data cleaning in order to make their data sets uh, uh, available to algorithms and things like that. So mm -hmm. in, in the machine learning world, though, there's a which is why I think there's a huge transition towards graph machine learning. Because it's all about how do you represent these relationships, right? So uh, a lot of comp a lot of large enterprise clients are now also moving towards graph machine learning, where you can see, okay, you know, here's this one user, but what are the different relationships within the different database? And these are models which you kind of define as well. So there is some knowledge representation there. So that's what I have been noticing, and we have been noticing that as well. And uh, and we have people like who are doing a lot of research within machine learning on these graph networks. So there's a lot of, I think that's where the industry, I mean, obviously it was a gap within the machine learning world and, and that's where a lot of push has been happening recently. And uh, it's, it's something we're looking at as well. But again, it, it goes to show that definitely from a commonality standpoint was definitely a gap, but then the herd, like the herd within the machine learning world is is looking at it as well. I think it's uh, it's important for the viewers to understand as well that when, when you think about, uh, graphs in, in the enterprise, there's two primary types of graphs that are out there. There's the property graph, which is traditionally used in a lot of uh, data science type approaches because you're generally taking one data set and putting it into a graph and, and exploring it with the properties within that data set. Um, the type of graphs that I deal with are semantic graphs and semantic graphs are use formal knowledge representation languages because uh, you're encoding the semantics, and so you're using OWL and RDF as your as your standardized languages, and and Sparkle as your standardized query language, and and uh, semantic graphs uh, support both knowledge engineering derived AI and data science derived AI, whereas property graphs normally only support data science derived AI because they're generally used just within the machine learning area or mm -hmm. deep learning area. True, and, and but but then there's, there's a notion of contextual knowledge graphs as well, where you're embedding information from other different sources now. Um, so in, in our case, for instance, um, so for instance, threat intelligence could be one uh, input of data, but then it still falls within the data science uh, realm. <laughs> in fact, when uh, when you, if you read uh, uh, Gartner or Forrester or any of those, um, the industry analyst, and they're talking about kind of the, the big data space. One of the topics that's pretty hot is, uh, is enterprise data fabrics. And one of the things that we're seeing uh, uh, is the use of these knowledge representation languages uh, within these enterprise data fabrics because they want to semantically inter uh, integrate the different silos so that way they're semantically interoperable within that enterprise data fabric. And we think about the same thing within uh, cybersecurity, creating an enterprise security data fabric using these knowledge representation languages. And uh, a really great example of that is in the IoT space where, you know, each IoT vendor has created their own little language of how their their IoT sensor or device talks. And the W3C has created the web of things effort, and that's designed to use these uh, standardized W3C knowledge representation languages to represent what each one of those uh, IoT devices is saying and to make it interoperable with what all the other devices are saying. And that's called the web of things. And, and that's designed to, to really make all that IoT semantically interoperable with support enhanced security of those IoT devices and eventually go into AI, the knowledge engineering derived AI to automate reasoning based on, on that integrated knowledge.
Wonderful. All right. So I actually, uh, as an observer, I kind of learn a lot of those uh, terminology and actually make my eyes open for a lot of new things. Uh, I'm, as I said, I'm not familiar with AI, but it's really good to know there's uh, three types of, or maybe more, uh, types of a graph, right? and also from different perspective to look at the, the data and how to transform the data eventually to become a, a decision-making kind of a factors. And it feels like also there's a, if I can say, okay, the, the, the middle part, so we, we talk about input is the data, the output is the final decision where you want to do something. The middle part, uh, before I come to this talk, I thought it's just like a black box. I don't know what, what kind of things happen. So somehow magically things will happen. Feels like here, at least there are a couple of things uh, involved with that process. One is from data science point of view, uh, using all kinds of machine learning or AI technology to, to, to find the patterns or to kind of make the data meaningful from, at least from machine point of view. Then they will add the, like a human side, the, the knowledge engineering driven to maybe take that data or the pattern already like a pro, uh, analyzed by machine to make that uh, even more like uh, for user friendly or what I call it to to make the final decisions and apply the common knowledge from the society, the industry, and further massage the, the knowledge and to to make that eventually you can uh, come to some conclusion. So am I right? I, I just yes. feel like this is a way to, to describe uh, you guys uh, you talk about. Yeah, so uh, I guess to give you a little bit of, of additional clarity, so I think you're 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 right on the money. Um, when it comes to the knowledge engineering side, just to kind of uh, make that box a white box rather than a black box for you, you think about. Um, uh, and I was going to get uh, use this this example. So we talked about how the data science side is giving these tentative hypotheses. So if I'm getting that, I'm going to collect that that initial finding. Uh, from the data science side, that initial information that I'm pulling in, that gets uh, reified or mapped, that raw data is mapped to the knowledge model. And that's what allows the knowledge engineering uh, derived AI to understand the meaning of that data is by mapping that information to the knowledge model. And then once it's mapped to the knowledge model, the AI can understand it, then it needs to apply or mimic how a human would go through that data to do things like a validation. How do I validate this tentative hypothesis or this preliminary finding? And that's really a workflow. And so you think of that as, as, as almost a, a thinking playbook or a step-by-step -step workflow mm -hmm. that's captured kind of in a playbook form that allows the AI to go, okay, I'm gonna pull this data in, I'm gonna filter it this way, I'm gonna transform it this way, I'm going to uh, apply uh, any type of logic and reasoning to make sense of it. And then finally, I'm going to uh, output a conclusion. In our case, we're outputting a semantic graph with the, the answers. And that's, uh, we're basically building a, uh, a scientific argument based on the evidence and reasoning and the facts that are in there. So that way we can go through and say this fact, and this is what it means, and this is why it means it, and, and explain exactly why we're arriving at the conclusion to either validate it or say that it's a false positive, whatever the, the end result may be. But it's entirely transparent and explainable as we kind of go through that process. Wonderful. All right, cool. So uh, that actually helped me uh, kind of establish uh, some, uh, using Sean's words, uh, the workflow, right? yeah. <laughs> how, how that uh, works together.